We are the official coffee of the U- UFC. Of UFC. Of UFC. Yeah, I got yelled at that one because I put the in there and I and that's not how you say it. People don't quite understand what the point of this stuff is. One, it's fun. It has to be fun. So if you don't like it, f- you. The Black Rifle Podcast starts now. So now we're so starting. Now the show. we're starting the show. <laughs> <laughs> now that we just knocked off all the things that we can't talk about on the show, right in a row. Yep, right in a row. So you went to Power Slap. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, that is an interesting sport. I think uh, the numbers that even even Dana showed on there, the one of their like female like slap box people has 171 million views. What? Yeah, crazy. I, I will say, I think it I think looks sh- gnarly. I'll probably go with Sean Strickland's description of it is I don't fully understand it, right? But it's really fucking fun to watch, okay? Because yeah, yeah. I mean, there's grown ass men and women that just like there's rules too, where if like if if you don't follow through with the slap, it's illegal. It's called like clubbing, I oh. guess. You have to like leave your heel or your foot on the ground. You can't overextend. It's a whole like weird thing. Mm, interesting. But, so it's kind of like Sears school where it's only like a six inch. You only have six inches and you got to follow through. No, they like, they, yeah. they get all the way down there and come up. But yeah, I mean, every time it's like probably I'd say 70% knockout rate. What? 70%? Dude, you're just eating a full on slap and there's three rounds, which means three slaps. Yeah. I what mean, it, the, dude, is this like a brain injury breeding ground? You know, I, I don't know how you can take that amount of hits like I that. Either. I mean, I think, I think. Normally, it's more like um, quantity of c- concussiveness. Like boxing right, is right. one of the worst things because you're just your brain's bouncing around so much. Right. But that that can't be good for you. It can't I, be good. No. That's like getting a car wreck three mm, times. Yeah. No, thank you. But I, it's fun. To, it's fun it. to watch. I mean, yeah. A, a God bless guys, the people that are doing it. Well, imagine I mean, you're a construction worker and you got a really good chin, and you're like, I'm gonna go do power slap, and then you make tens of thousands of dollars. You support your family. I mean, that's a really good yeah. opportunity. Yeah. It yeah. really reminds me of the new era of over the top. Do you remember that movie? With, yeah. Uh, arm wrestler Stallone. Oh, where he's yeah. the trucker arm one, wrestler. One of the best movies ever. He's got the training device in yeah. the long haul truck. Yep. He's the fittest trucker that ever lived. Ever. He's got like a six pack. He's like, <laughs> rung, 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 rung. Yeah. I actually, like, I've I, never seen a trucker look I, like him in any flying J across the United States I've ever had. To oh no, him. no. Right? I mean, when you sit for like 18 hours a day in a truck, I feel like. I don't like... know if it's legal for you to drive 18 hours that would be there are restrictions right yeah, yeah they're yeah, not anymore be. yeah you can't do that anymore i mean not legally i mean like meth up and problem. hit the road yeah you know? right like it's like what the germans did during the blitzkrieg just <laughs> go for yeah. it yeah yeah, yeah. 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 that's but right power slap seems like a new version like it's it's cool it, like you watch you're like wow this is crazy the it spectacle is crazy. of is it, it is loud? insane did you have good tickets were you close? oh yeah no so it was in like a ballroom and this is the first event that like actually like some of the public could go and we, right. you know, the UFC was nice enough to gift us the tickets, but yeah, I mean, it's just like, and you could hear it like echoes through the ballroom and you're right. I mean, we're, you know, a stone's throw away from the Holy athletes. Crap. Do you think they're, are they like, sorry about flat? that sound. I totally just capped that yeah, for you there, probably. Heston. Are they like kind of cupping? Yeah. They, they kind of like cup. Flat? They yeah. kind of cup it, but then like, I don't, yeah, I don't I have to look at the rule book, but there's a whole thing. There. Are you though? Are you going to look at the rule book? Are you gonna look the? Are you gonna download the PDF Power I Slap? Am. I am. Power Slap PDF. And it was kind of like, and I don't mean this in a rude way, but it was kind of reminded me of like my drunk uncles when we go to the lake and yeah, everybody yeah, gets a little buzzed up yeah. and we start like, who can take the hardest slap? Yep. So it was, it was kind of reminiscent of like, you know, growing up. I liked it. I could see that. I've seen a lot of it on shorts and clips. Yeah, it is wickedly viral because you can't be entertained more than watching a grown man take a full slap and then have his knees buckle after yeah. like that slow-mo yeah it, they chalk up their hands too right oh, so when they chalk chalk. up and then it just goes boosh it's like a fucking cloud and their fo- their entire face in that slow-mo cam yep. yeah was completely contorted it's a wild it's a, it's a perfect short clip yeah they have a they have to hold this like little like thing behind him. So, I mean, it takes balls because you're literally standing in front of another grown man with your yeah, arms behind your back holding yeah. it. Just you and Logan should try it. this for this episode. <laughs> you should, you guys I think should, we both have enough TBI. Why, we don't need to why do not all three of us? <laughs> yeah. What? You don't want to be? Next, a, my next oh, yeah, you're next. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. My you're neck. Neck. <laughs> I would be curious to talk to some of the contestants to see like what makes you successful at this and like how you can hold up a little bit better. Thick I read. Skull. 
Well, I it's read a not too long ago that um, like people who have their molars removed are like their jaws aren't quite as structurally sound as people who still are you have reading their like molars? academic dentist. Uh, <laughs> Like uh, that's yeah. what you do when you Donna's yeah. papers. Where, where are you yeah. finding this Your casual poop <laughs> literature? Like, yeah, I'm gonna get on Google Academia and read up on. Uh, well, molar you start removal. going down the like. Well, what what makes you stand up to a what what makes you have a good chin? Oh, and you start okay. going down I that. I right. think I saw something about uh, McGregor got his molars removed, huh. and like after that, he started. Uh, he had quite a bit more. Uh, KOs against him than he did before that. Um, so it was kind of this like, oh, this brought the topic up, and then they kind of started to like show diagrams of the jaw and science. Stuff. Yeah. science. That sounds like marine science. No offense, Logan, but well, you it your, might be. You I'm not rib, saying it's a truth at all. Rib, right? I'm just saying mm-hmm. it's interesting that I want like what makes you better, like having a good chin being stout like a good neck i think it's how you land the slap too because there are a couple athletes like one of them like hit him really fucking hard in the face and then their second go around like missed it and just kind of like breezed them oh, and it right, didn't right. even phase the guy huh. so it's like if you miss that you're fucked you're like great now i have to eat a shot oh i put I one on instagram that. i mean the dude just got sent to space he like <laughs> fell on the podium and then falls back and just like hits the ground. And then they have like two, at least two guys there to catch him. And then yeah. randomly I'm sitting there and going like, that's Stefan Bonner up there. And that's Forrest Griffin. And that's uh, Anthony Smith. Like all these professional high-class UFC fighters right. are like part of like the judging thing. Seriously? And they got like the glasses recording. Yeah, it's a whole operation. It was cool. That's, that's a, that is cool. Plus the Super Bowl was down there in Vegas this weekend too. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, we got out. I've never <laughs> seen the Vegas airport that dead we flew out at seven in the morning and it was saturday the day before the super bowl there was not one person in line leaving to leave vegas yeah, i'm sure logie and i watched I, I mean this is the first super bowl my wife had to remind me that the super bowl was today sports she's like hey super bowl is today i was like that is sports that is yeah, yeah. that is <clears throat> that's sports that's cool it's on and then logan showed up because he's staying at the house oh and i uh, Threw it he on. threw it on for the OT, so I caught all of the OT, and I was like, this is perfect, actually. I missed the entire game. You sound like you know sports when you say OT instead of overtime. Yeah, it's, it's no big deal. No big deal. <laughs> I don't like to you know, flex my my sports knowledge and you know abbreviations like OT or, or TKO TD. or STD. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this episode comes out on Wednesday, so that's yep. good. So, um, yeah. Well, we can kind of talk about something exciting, which is the UFC partnership that we are doing because we announce, um, uh, which will be tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow, yeah. yeah. Super Tuesday. exciting. So it will be 24 hours old by the time this episode comes out. But if you're listening to it, you didn't catch that. We are the official coffee of the U- UFC. Of UFC. Oh, of UFC. Yeah, I got yelled at that one because I put the in there and I learned that's not how you say it. You can't. Mm. Why? That's not how their brand guidelines are. Anymore. Oh, interesting. I don't know. I'm just learning. I'm just trying yeah, to do yeah. it right, you know? Yeah, trying to learn. No, I mean, I'm so excited for that. I mean, everybody knows throughout the years that, yeah. like, that is my sport that I love watching, and it's absolutely awesome. And Dana White, man, what a, what a what an amazing American business owner and entrepreneur. Yeah. That guy is fucking legendary. I had the yeah. opportunity to sit down with him for a little bit, and, man, I can't speak higher of that guy. Yeah, he's a... We did a conference call a couple months ago. Yeah. It was you, me, and uh, Chris, the CEO. Uh, I was blown away with the level of intensity because, and to be fair, he's super authentic. There's really, I don't think, any way you can put on that type of a show for just the the, the PR. Yeah. So he is more intense in person than he had, than he is like in press conferences and the other things that he's you know, his appearances. So he's exactly who he is. It's that, that's why I asked him. I was like, how do you keep up this energy? Cause I think he's like 55 and he's just like da, 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 going from meeting to meeting to right, meeting. Right, and I was right. like, I, what's the secret juice, man? Like coffee. Cause coffee. I'm trying to keep it up. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm excited because like one, they're great partners Two, It's a fucking really exciting sport. So it's the I'm best. Super, super excited. And then with that partnership um, announcement, I, I would strongly suggest everybody go to the Black Rifle Coffee YouTube and watch the um, Hunter 7 Presents yep. that we did. Uh, you know, Evan's been working with them forever, and Hunter 7 is just an amazing, amazing organization that, you know, specializes in cancer research. Mm-hmm. 
And um, we were able to do a partnership with the UFC early on, on November 11th of last year to uh, put 107 on the, the mats, um, raise some pretty significant funds for them. Just great, great fucking people. Um, mm-hmm. And I, please watch that, that presents. I watched it um, over the weekend and uh, yeah, there was, I was cutting onions and that shit. It was, it's heavy. It's super heavy. Um, yeah. But it's, it's an, it's a very, it's needed information for people to know. Well, it's going to save lives. Yeah, I think to that point, we'll, we'll come back to that too, which is, you know, everything we do here is to try to lead by example, which is how do you build a great American business? How do you be positive, professional, polite, and profitable? And how do you build a culture around a company that continues to give back to the people that you care about? It's no surprise as to who do we care about because obviously we're all GWAT veterans here. You know, our our job is to go out and hopefully inspire people to not only build great businesses, you know, guys transitioning, you know, people getting out of the mill that want to start a, start a business. It doesn't mean that you have to start a business and then become publicly traded in 10 years. It means you could start a business, you could emancipate yourself from government service and go out. And now you have the opportunity to, to build the type of culture that you want internally. You can plug into your community and you can start to really build not only value within your own life, but value within your company's life and then value within the community, the town that you live in or the subculture that you're trying to give back. So most people, I think at times they, they, they miss the, the bigger intent, the goal, the strategic goal, which is how do you build a great company? Well, first you have to define what is great. What does it mean to be a great company? Everything we do is to try to not only inspire that community, but also give back to the things that we believe in. So it's profit with a purpose. One of the things I, I want to really try to explain is I I believe in nonprofits, meaning their core competency is going out and solving problems for the community. Yeah. But the way we've chosen to plug into this is not through being a nonprofit. It's by being a profitable company. I think that you have to fully embrace the American way of life, which is serve your country, transition, and then succeed within the capitalist system that that we built. Emphasizing success in both of those becomes really, really important. Uh, So going back to Hunter and Hunter Seven, Hunter Seven has been, uh, I think, a, a, a very good partner to us for several years. Uh, Chelsea and the people that are over there, they're incredible. Uh, Her intensity just makes yeah, me so awesome. happy. She's so, so intense funny. She, it, you, you get to meet those people in life that yeah. like have that drive and that purpose and they like fucking bleed for it. She's one yeah. of them. So, yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing is like, you know, you build a great product, which is, you know, we, we, we roast coffee. We serve hundreds of thousands of customers. And the other thing that we do is we go back to our grocery partners and some of our other partners and we... Uh, politely request in order to partner with us that they also team up to raise money yeah. for veteran nonprofits. Uh, as the GWAT continues to age and we continue to age, civilians will become, uh, I would say, less focused on it. Yep. It'll become less cool or in vogue to support operators. And operators ultimately, at the end of the day, will start to age and their health issues will become more of an issue as people care less and less. So our job is to keep that front and center, maintain mission focus, great company, great coffee, uh, Hunter seven and highly encourage you guys to go watch that. Hunter seven is a very serious organization that does extremely important work for our community. And if we don't identify that and help promote them, we're, we're failing. Yeah. And I also look at it from the perspective of not only from like, you know, raising funds to support what they're doing, but also just getting the the message out there to the GWAT veteran that yeah. if you get pre-screened for cancer, you, your survivability goes up, like name the statistic, right? But right. like the opportunity to be a proper diagnosis, see if you're at risk, see what toxic exposure you have. It's like the difference between being a father and <clears throat> not being there for your kids. And you'll see that in the video about some of the stuff with VA and misdiagnosis mm-hmm. and it's it's fucking tragic. But we have to get that information out there to your point, I think, so people can not only like support the organization, but if they're a GWAT veteran that were by, was by a burn pit, like 
go get pre-screened, man. <laughs> like, yeah, go it, do it. <laughs> it. It could be Stop anything, fucking around. Right? I mean, carcinogens and, yeah, anything. And, and toxic and chemical exposures, it could be anything. And it's, you know, it could be, uh, you know, breaching the exterior walls of compounds with no breathing apparatus and breathing in all the Remember that when you do like a, like a water impulse charge on like Boosh. one of those doors, yeah. boom, and you're running through, it's just a fucking black mist, mist shit. in your yeah. Yeah. lungs. Yeah. There's exterior Afghan walls. Right? Yeah, like nasty. Nasty shit. Yeah, I think the awareness on it's really important because we kind of have GWA guys. You kind of have the assumption that like Vietnam guys had it so bad with Agent Orange and yeah. some mm -hmm. of the other stuff that they were exposed to that we we're kind of like, oh, well, you know, whatever. Like burn pits can't be anything close to the exposure that those guys Stop had. Stop being a pussy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you start to look at some of the data on it coming back, and the burn pit stuff is like it's really bad and like. Those things were everywhere. Like you just didn't have the opportunity to to do anything else with it. So it was just like throw it in the burn. Yeah, there's in. certain instances with their research that they've done that we're looking at like three hundred percent, three hundred percent increased chance of getting cancer yeah. Yeah. compared to the age group of of, this, of a non G Watt veteran, and that yeah. is like astoundingly yeah. terrifying. Like, yeah, I was just going through the some of the promotional stuff we were doing for the episode, and it was a screener that they were doing and it was close to 450 guys that were screened. Yep. Um, of those about half, a little less than half, about 210, 212. Um, don't quote me exactly. Um, we're at risk for, for cancer exposure. And then of that, like 67, 67 tested positive for mm. it. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> fucking staggering. <laughs> and yeah. the, you know, you extrapolate that, like that's a lot of people that, probably have cancer that probably have no idea yeah. for it and it's one of those things like we don't really want to face that like we don't you know in your late 30s early 40s you don't want to have to deal with potentially going to get screened for cancer right now no and you, you also think about the other variables right which is the let's say sun exposure to our drinking water so we had like yeah, you know those plastic Plastics water the bottles that were flown stuff. in and sat on pallets, and then they baked in the sun at 110, 120 degrees. So you have all the leaching from the plastics into the water, and then that's the only water that you have. Basically, you have MREs that are basically just preservatives, and then they're also wrapped in plastic. And then you're cooking the MRE itself in a plastic bag. So it's like plastics and carcinogens and the exposure and leaching from the plastics into the food or the water, then you you add all the other variables, which is increased cortisol levels because of stress, sleep deprivation, you have stress and sleep deprivation, you have all these different health issues that are kind of plugged in to culminate in what I think is is the way that your your DNA is absorbing not only the stress, but also the chemicals that you're taking in. So it could be from burn pits and water bottles and MREs, we took every vaccine under the sun, which I'm not anti-vaxxer, just like, I didn't fucking care, right? It's like, ah, oh, shoot me up with anything, man. I don't even know half the shit I got. But I got multiple rounds of whatever. Yeah. Like, I did that once. I lost my health records. And they're like, well, just give it to you again. I'm like, does that? Is yeah, that, yeah. Is that what I'm supposed to say? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you got some coffee on your forehead. Yeah, on your That's head. A, that's, it's good. It's like a... Yeah, well, it's like a... Then you add... Third like, coffee. Uh, explosives and yeah, you know, RDX and all that good stuff. All the things. Yeah. You know, also, I know this might come as a surprise to a lot of people, but there's not as if there's emission standards on Blackhawks and tanks and track vehicles and Humvees. Like you're you're full dosing yourself at times. I remember like sleeping next to like tanks as they're fucking fire up their engines. Like you can you're just exposed to fuel and exhaust and plastics and all this shit all the time. And if you have multiple rotations, multiple years, and it doesn't take multiple rotations in multiple years, it's just the amount of chemical exposure is wild. Inside vehicles and the uh, radiation from radios. Like think about how many jammers, and, you know, anti-jamming devices, all the VHF, HF, all the fucking radios that we're in and around all the time, and all that radiation just getting fucking blasted around in our armored vehicles. Like, yeah, it's it's not. It doesn't surprise me. So 
that's for me, it's one of those things that I, I kind of see this is, this is our age in orange. It's the, it's the, uh, I would say the, the exponential exposure to radiation and chemicals over the course of a professional career that people just have to be directly plugged in and they have to understand it so they can go get the help that they well, need. I think it's the moral obligation of American mm -hmm. society to put focus on that because to your point, you look back at Agent Orange, how the Vietnam veteran was treated returning home. I mean, awful. It was awful. catastrophic. And so it's like, as a nation, we have to do better. Mm -hmm. And this is like a step with Hunter 7 and what they've done. So yeah, check yeah. out that video. I think it's super educational. And like, you guys yeah. check out the website. Like it, it's, it's worth watching. It's nine minutes. Like you get, you got nine minutes. You got nine yeah. minutes. Go check it out. What, what else is new? I feel like you haven't fucking talked to you guys forever. Everyone's running around, working, living life. Um, my wife's building a table. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's a woodworker, I guess now. Yeah, yeah she's doing the whole like you she's know doing the whole thing, dude. Yeah, she's like doing the whole thing. So she's building the table. I don't know. It's, it's kind of like kids. Wife, family, going to Daytona this weekend. Gonna do oh, you're gonna get some fishing. fishing. Yeah. Oh, I'm not. I'm not on that one. I'm going to the UFC. So I know. I know. I know. But man, fishing down there with Mr. Morris is is it's like the best. It's the best. I think it's probably because I caught a bigger bass than you last time that you just don't want me to go. Humble Matt. Yeah, humble Matt. Well, the funny part is, is. He had a missed hit on his lure by the big bass. It wasn't his fault. It just spit it. And then by the time he couldn't get it in, I recasted right under yeah. the lily pads and bam, hit it. The old two pieces of gum. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot's changed. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, what's new with my, I mean, my freaking life's been pretty crazy lately, personally. Like, freaking wife and I got separated months ago, and so I'm just figuring out life, focused on business, you know? Yeah, yeah. Getting it done. Yeah. How's that going? Good. Good. Yeah. All's well. I want everyone to be happy. That's right. I'm in the pursuit of happiness. That's all I'm at. The pursuit of happiness. It's in the Constitution. You should, it is. You should, uh, you should, should be get happy. after it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm a, um, a militia, pretty much, you know? Keep buying guns. Yeah. The Matt militia. Dude, okay. Speaking about guns. So Maxim Defense, who are awesome guys, just sent me out three new of their SBRs that um, I'm going to take on. But I'm going to 500,000 acres in South Texas. To shoot hogs. To shoot helicopter hogs, and I think there's some like odd ad management and some other stuff I got to go down. Are you there. doing this with Clint? No, I'm yeah. actually taking my two brothers, which is gonna be. I haven't hung out with my two brothers, just us three, in oh. probably a decade. Wow. You know, they're always like kids or right. other. Is family. Your dad going? No, yeah. it, it's gonna be a little too of an intensive a hunt. I mean, right. we're gonna probably be like under rotor for four hours a day, oh, like, cool. flying heavy. So I'm. Yeah, yeah. I got to bring the GoPro on that one and yeah. show you guys what's up. Are you hunting odd ad from the helicopter? I have to find out. There's some management stuff with some females that yeah. it's, it's all like a highly, you know, managed property. Yeah. But it's, I think so. It's like women fun. manage this? <laughs> 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 Probably because the men would just kill everything. But they like yeah. bobcats, coyotes. It's all yeah, predatory yeah, yeah. management too. So that like, man, I'm excited for that. Yeah, oh, the odd cool. ad in Texas is is crazy. You would never expect that their their numbers are as high as they are, and they love like living up in the top of the mountains. Like you don't think there's a lot of mountains or whatever elevation in texas but yeah. uh, especially in west texas you get out there and there's like you're like holy yeah. shit this is like arizona canyons and stuff and they like to live way up at the top of that stuff so you got to hike up three thousand feet to even get close to them it's so fun I, don't yeah. know, I, I can't make it but uh cole kramer's going to the exact location that i'm gonna go pretty much to go helo hunting um and there was just like freaking brute of an odd ad the biggest one i've ever seen he sent me a photo and he's like i need a strong hiker to go kill this thing but the dates didn't line up unfortunately yeah. he texted me uh yesterday no day before yesterday and said when are you gonna stop blowing off your friends and <laughs> i was like i don't know when i don't have a business and a wife and two kids i, I what can i say i don't know but yeah he was giving me a little bit of a guilt trip yeah that's that's okay. I'll get out there someday. Rightfully so, you know? Yeah. I wish we could all hunt full-time. Fucker. Right? You know? Must yeah. be nice coal. Must be nice to be a guide. Yeah. Yeah. What was a good hunt? I got to go out there with him in West Texas. And it was... That's it right. Was, that's the same place I think you I, went. Probably. Yeah. No, it is. It yeah. is. He referenced that. 
yeah, okay. with, with uh, Mr. Bill. And uh, they have a really nice ranch out. Um, it's not too far from Marfa, Texas. And like the, one of those places you go to and you're like, you feel like you're stepping back in time. Like you can imagine yourself riding horseback through here and you had to like, oh, don't go through that canyon. You know, it's like, yeah, not, not a good, you could get ambushed riding through there. You right, know what right. I mean? You had the circle of wagons in that, in that canyon. Yeah. And you're just, you just never expect Texas to just have these like influx. Like we would run into herds of thou or hundreds of odd ad. Seriously? Yeah. They're oh. just like, there's. They're massive. Well, There's Texas so is so many. fucking huge. I was thinking about that. It's like the 11th largest economy in the I world. Was, yeah, I was just yeah. 10 or 11. I think it I think might it even be higher than that. I think it might be the eighth largest economy it's, in the world. It's, or it's, maybe California. It's up there. California is California like seven. I think. Is it seven? Yeah. No. And like, what a good, a good state, you know? Like, Texas is like, our economy is bigger than I, your fucking country. Yeah, I, I love think, it. I, I think Texas is bigger than Britain. I believe so. Yeah. It, it outranks a few like sizable, well-known countries. Right. I mean, you it's could, definitely bigger than like. Was it eighth? Yeah. Eighth largest eighth? economy. Okay. Eighth largest What's economy the in the it? world. It's like two point four trillion. Jeez. That's Texas. That's Texas. What's Cali? Um, I think Cali's like three or four. Okay. It's huge. Let's look. I thought it was like seven. Because if you think but, about like New York, Texas, and California. They're in the top, I believe they're in the top Fifth. 10. Fifth. Yeah. So, and then, so three of our states are in the top 10 economies. America! Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was really funny. I was listening to some clips about uh, Tucker's interview with, yeah, yeah. with Putin, and he asked him about the dollar and stuff. And, like, the the weird thought train that Putin goes down is so interesting to listen to. You're like, what planet are you on, man? I, I just can't. Imagine how interesting, what, whether or not you respect him or not, politically or like whatever he is, like he has got to be a fascinating person as to what the fuck is going on. Because you think about like that guy's life experience, military <laughs> KGB, then watch the collapse of the Soviet Union take over essentially as the president of Russia, which, I mean, to be fair, I think he's, he's, he's been doing that for 30 years. So if you think about that, that guy, just the life experience, that guy's been running Russia for longer than most of their royalty. Yeah. Like, and he was a KGB guy yeah. in the Cold War. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And he didn't come Very from like stories. a an oligarchy family like no. he came from nothing like his his i started reading uh, a biography on him and it was a little dense i didn't get all the way through it but his grandfather like has this crazy world war ii story he was basically like left alone and he had to move from the the western front like all the way back to safety and then he had to like convince people that he didn't you know abandon his post or anything and somehow survived and like Everyone but his grandfather was killed. It, it's an insane wow. story. There's he's like, an intense guy. Like yeah. he's, a, he's a very intense character. When he was talking about the the devaluing of the U.S. dollar, it kind of that's the the cornerstone currency, the international cornerstone currency, and how the the government is increasing or devaluing the currency by increasing money, and which is basically inflation. If you're tracking it from a, a you know keep it simple stupid type term i'm like he's not wrong <laughs> like they just keep printing more money and then the 34 trillion dollars in debt that you're thinking about yeah. like that ultimately somebody is going to have to service that debt which is the taxpayer uh like those are valid specifically valid points these are points that also americans a lot of americans are making so i kept thinking about is he placating specifically and there has to be a percentage of that where he's placating to a very a, an American voter saying like, oh, you know what? I, I, I agree sure. to this. So whether or not he truly believes it because he's using this as a as, a, as an event essentially to um, co-op, you know, a section of, of the American public because he can say whatever the fuck he wants to say. Like, it's not as if like, 
Russians are going to have access to this information because he can control the information inside his own borders. So he can say whatever he wants. It's just going to be televised specifically to America. Did you w- watch the whole interview? I, I jumped around like 30 minutes probably. <laughs> no, I, I haven't had, I haven't had the time. I want to sit down and just watch it. it. It, I mean, just in general, I think it's fascinating that a journalist got to go out. We haven't heard interview from him in like him. four years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fucking fascinating. Mm. When you think about it, that guy spent time, a significant amount of time with like the Bush administration and then the Obama administration, the Trump administration. Like he has seen multiple different administrations in the United States. Like he's been around for a long time. I was, I was like reading some things on it. I read like a, a full in depth article on, on it from, it might've been Matt Taibbi. I'm not sure, but like he sounded like a, uh, 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 a Russian history professor at times. <laughs> like I was like, you know, reciting Russian history and the comparisons were like, Biden can't remember where he fucking, where he is half the time. <laughs> and then Putin's giving like a 30 year uh, lecture series in, yeah. or, or like a 30 minute lecture series on Russian history with like detailed specific points. And like, you know, our president can't remember where his fucking keys are. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's the that's the danger of electing like elderly. Yeah. Yeah, and either like whatever opinions you have on Putin, I I think it is just interesting that we're able to like hear this perspective. Like I'm. Oh, I yeah, I think it's great. I'm such a huge fan of like just being able to hear perspective, like no matter where it comes from. Like that was always such a big part of of being in the Marine Corps was like, know thine enemy or know the other perspective. Like I just really appreciate the fact that he would, he'd like had the balls to go do that. I'm more of a simpleton, you know, where it's like bad guy, gun, me shoot. That's where I keep it. You know, right. Keep it, keep the knuckles on the ground. Sometimes it makes life a little bit simpler. <laughs> yeah, it does. I try to digest everything going on in the world. S- speaking of the knuckles on the ground, um, <clears throat> I love the UFC partnership and uh like you've you've uh you've always been like a big MMA guy. Like when did you did you start like really getting into it before the military? Um I grew up I did a little jiu-jitsu um when I was working two jobs in high school so I could pay for it myself. But I don't know, fucking jiu-jitsu was expensive back in the day. It was like 100 bucks a month. Yeah. Expensive. Um so I did that and then I got into like yeah, kickboxing and Muay Thai. What got and- you into Jiu-jitsu in high school. I just liked it. I just, yeah. I, I forget specifically if it was someone that influenced me, but I just, I just enjoyed it, like being able to protect yourself and shit. Um, and I had a private actually. Um, one of my privates in Ranger Bat was a black belt, and so when we were in Afghanistan, uh, we would spar like four times a week because he had the time to do it. Yeah. Um, or roll, should I say? But no, I just, I just, it's fucking fun getting punched in the face and fighting people. I got a, that gym in Grindhouse down. Uh, yeah. Went back in their spar day, and that was fun, getting punched. So yeah, I just enjoy it. And honestly, like the UFC at, at that caliber and how they've like conditioned athletes through the years now to like start at the age of five and then like having that athletic yeah. prowess, like it is just <clears throat> like so high level shit because someone that's done that for, I don't know, eight, nine years myself, like like they could beat me up with one fucking hand, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's for me, it's super fun to watch. Even like the grappling exchanges, like the blow, Bo Nichols of the world that are coming up. It is just unbelievably athletic and cool. Yeah. It's one of those things I wish, um, cause I, I grew up playing hockey and then that got too expensive and I wasn't able to like keep doing it. You know, I, I wish that I would have started jujitsu like when I was a kid, mm. like you can see how those skills and the mindset transcend, uh, doing that specific activity and how that can serve you, you know, especially if you're getting into the military. Like yeah. the first thing we did was starting doing, you know, the Marine Corps mixed martial arts program. And I thought that we never got enough of that training. Are you in one the of those infantry. guys? Bro, I'm a level one. Well, <laughs> what, it they, was, what do they call it in Marine Corps? Well, you have the colored belt system. Uh, yeah. And it's yeah. like, it's like tan belt, gray belt, green belt, and then black belt. And there's degrees of black belt. And, I was like, I was thinking that in the Marine Corps, like we would be doing this all yeah. the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I never thought that we did it enough. And I was always disappointed that we weren't. Mm. It was like the time that we did it the most was like on ship. Yeah. Like when we had a, a little bit more time to like 
do whatever we wanted. But my my favorite form of I I would look back on it is called hazing. But my my late squad leader who who was killed in combat, he would make us overseas box, and he was this like fucking strong ass Mexican guy, right? Like just that Mexican fighting spirit. And uh, it seemed that every time if we did something wrong, like he's like, oh, it's it's boxing PT today. And I remember yeah. one time he, the, one of the privates he absolutely hated, just sent him into the fucking spirit world because he <laughs> just like hook after hook, like knocked him out and I, whatever he had to get off his chest. But I was like, that's kind of a cool leadership thing. Like throw, make your privates throw in the gloves and eat some shots. Yeah. Yeah. We had um, Brian Shantosh on the show a couple episodes ago and he was a company CEO uh, when I was a, a boot on my first deployment and he boxed every single person in his company for 30 seconds in a row. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like 150 dudes, just one after yeah. the other. It was to earn their pass. Really? Yeah. It's kind of a baller way of doing it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if there's a better way to do it. Like as a, he's like, as a commander, that was because I asked him about it offline and uh, we didn't get too much of it in, into the podcast. But he's like, you know, as a commander, it was one of those things that you're going to lead these men in combat. They also need to understand that I can beat all their asses. <laughs> like, yeah. like, there is nobody, like, trying to 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 come up on you, you know, like, give you any flack. And honestly, he's like, the Marine Corps does that, you know, pretty good job of instilling, you know, order and chain of command. But he's like nothing reinforces the chain of command, like knowing that you can beat the shit out of everybody. <laughs> and yeah, I'm like, yeah. yeah, that's pretty solid, man. Like that's, that's like a, a really, uh, it's, it's sound and sage advice. Well, I think the respect even doing that, even yeah. if you didn't beat every dude up, it's like, that's the respect of even showing up to do something like that. That guy's so hard. Great. God, he's so hard, man. Like that guy's fuck. He's legendary. Like if you guys haven't listened to that episode, I would highly recommend Go back and listen to that episode because he's he's truly an in an in, in inspirational American. He's a great American, and there's he he falls into what I would say is a one percent category or less than one percent category of humans on the planet for sure. Uh, yes, he, you know he did earn the Navy Cross in Iraq. I keep messing that up, um, and. He talks about that on the episode, but really, like the guy is like introspective. He's he's got a he's 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 got a lot to say. It's a great episode. Um, anyway. I haven't listened to it. I will check it out. Yeah. Did you guys get into his like little shipping container thing? I can't no, remember. dude. I I didn't know about that until the next day. This guy, he did this. Uh, it was for the Canadian military. They did a research program where they wanted to see the physical effects on a human during physical exertion for extended periods of time with depredation. So he, they basically locked him in a connex with no light, no sound. Like it was basically a soundproof studio with no light or no sound in a treadmill, which was basically a self-propelled treadmill. So there's no electronics. And then how many miles could you run in 24 hours in a complete deprived state oh wow so he ran i believe 86 or 84 miles in 24 hours in wow. a complete blackout state on a treadmill and i i can't help but think like man i want to do something with this because we were talking about doing a um like a, a a race, which is like you know the the you know big fish for his foundation or something, you know where it's like he invites out like ten guys, you lock them in a shipping container for an unspecified amount of time, and then you have to run as many miles as you can in a completely deprived state, which sounds excruciatingly fucking hard, but yeah. it puts a whole new spin on ultra marathon. <laughs> it's yeah. like what yeah. the fuck, man. Like I didn't know you had to run in an isolation chamber. That sounds wonky. Oh, it sounds intense. well. Like the yeah, the difficulty of just being able to move on a treadmill in the dark. Yeah, um, like y you have to hang on. Like since I heard about this, I've been like closing my eyes. Like you just can't you can't run in the dark without holding on to something. Like you need support. So that means you have to go slower. So I think that he averaged like two and a half miles an hour over the course right. of twenty four hours or something like that. But the capability you also need to have and the the foresight to like 
be able to handle your nutrition to be able to go that long, like the amount of calories that you're going to be burning. Right. Like you have to have a constant intake of high calories in order to even sustain yourself. Like mm-hmm. did, did you have food and water? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, it was unsupported, so he had to support himself throughout the, that, that entire twenty four hours. Okay, unlike you know a lot of ultras in the United States, they're supported. Yeah, um, and or events where they would have like indoor treadmills and they do the same thing. They're they're all supported, right. whereas this is all self supported and completely deprived of you know sound and light, which is fucking wild. You just you left to literally it. your own thoughts <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then having to like break through like the, the mental strain of and physical strain that's that's crazy that's intense yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i want to try running in the dark now he's a bad yeah. motherfucker man Dude, it's he, crazy to think about like just like go do it for an hour and just like imagine doing that for a whole day with no one there to talk to you yeah. no support and then like you start going through the mental angst of you don't know how long you've been going. Mm-hmm. Like you, you have to try and pace yourself in the midst of all this. Like you think about, yeah, okay, like, I got to go for the first six hours. Too. Like you're like, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Like the first six hours, you're like, I'm a quarter of the way through. You have no idea if that's actually the case or not. And then you have to go another 18 hours. Like you, the, the mental pain cave that you just have to go into is just astronomical. I can't even imagine, like think about like even trying to pace yourself in that because you would, you would lose count. So you'd have to come up with a, a means of counting that would be sustainable. Yeah. Like the, mental ranger beads. Yeah. Mental ranger beads. Like, did you that, ever use Ranger Beads? Yeah. Um, I've used them in multiple ways. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you don't have Ranger Beads, yeah, it's like every, every whatever, like... Uh, every 10, you pull down a big one. So yeah. you have 10 on the bottom, yeah. you have like five on the... T- and you can make it however you want. Yeah. Right? And then it's yeah. like, pull down 10 and fucking throw down one. It's per, per step. step. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I was thinking, I was like, you know, you do, you do decent movements in the military, You're like, do a 20k hike or whatever but like i've never just straight moved for 24 hours straight there's a really interesting race that they do um i can't remember what it's called but it's basically like you every hour on the hour you have to do like a four mile to four and a half mile loop and it's basically the last like it goes until there's only one person left and they end up doing like 127 miles or something I'm like, like Kenny that. Powers. I'm not trying to be the best at exercising, you know? I, right. I, I'm, I'm good. I'll just yeah. keep the heart a little healthy, make sure the body looks good, and call it a day. Well, you just wonder, like, how you can do that without, like, breaking yourself. Like, yeah. yeah. That's so much constant movement. Edwin, um, Edwin Parnell, our uh, local coffee aficionado, he's doing the 240 this year. The Moab 240. Yeah. 240 miles. Yeah. Yeah. 240. Which you have to do over, I think you have seven days Mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. It's a week. You get a week, 240 miles. Like that, that is legit. When you think about 240 fucking miles, individual movement, it, that from a, from a physical perspective that puts people into a totally different dimension. Yeah, yeah, it sounds absolutely awful. I mean, I think it's good to like test your mental fortitude and keep strong, but like I would rather just get my ass beat by a fighter and pinned up and feel really out of shape right. and punched in the face than like 240 miles. It's just, it's not my cup of tea. Yeah, I think, no way. I think that would be the draw for me is like it's psychotic. Like it's, it's crazy, utterly crazy. Yeah. It, yeah. Like that's why I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like maybe, maybe that would be kind of like because it's just freaking crazy. Yeah. Like what what do you have to like what place be alive? What place do you have to go to in order to do that successfully mentally? Like that that's something you like you'll never have to go there in in any other way. Mm-hmm. Like my my wife's done them like a few times. Like she's done She's in ultras, right? Yeah. 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 She's done uh yeah, she is a, a running mofo. Yeah, she's like you know, I mean I think since she had the I don't know. Our youngest is six, so she's cut back on her mileage. But before that, she was like crushing, like crushing the mileage. And i I think it's I think it's a form of meditation. Like she likes like 
repetitive type activities. Like she likes to knit and do all these like kind of like really cool repetitive things that, and uh, I would find them somewhat monotonous at times, but she likes to build these really elaborate things and take, takes her like weeks or months or whatever. And it's, it's interesting because I live in a household with a person that's kind of driven on those types of skills where, or those types of things. Activities. That, yeah. 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 So, you know, she's, she's a bit more introverted than most. So she's fairly introverted, which I think most of the ultra runners and I'm, I'm generalizing. I think they are pretty introverted as, as a, as a collective goal. I think you a can, lot of time in your own head. Yeah. I think you have to be, I think yeah. you, like you have to figure out how to, spend that much time in your own head and you have to be a little selfish because the amount of training that you have to do in order to do that successfully is astronomical. Yeah. Well, and I love to run. Like, like if I didn't have Achilles tendonitis issues, I would run 10 miles a day easily. I wouldn't, wouldn't have a problem with it. I, I mean, there was a time in my life when I would run 70, 80 miles a week. And if I could run more, I'd run more, but I'm constantly injured. So, you know, I run, Still, I don't know. I think on a light day, it's like two, three miles. Like yeah. a light day. Yeah, that's like a light day. Most of the time, it's like five. Does your like ankles start flaring up? After no, my ankles yours. have never or been. Achilles, excuse me. My Achilles, my left Achilles, for whatever reason, I tore my right medial gastroc, which is my calf, my right leg. And I broke my, uh, like a bone in my lower back like that connects in from your spine into your hip. So it's on my left side because I think my hips are just a little bit wonky because of I crushed that bone. And Someone threw your hips out of alignment, right? Yeah, naturally. Yeah, naturally. <laughs> so I think I think because like my right calf and then my left my left hip, it just throws my gait off a little bit. And I've had it like, you know, running coaches look at it and they're like, "Yeah, you've got kind of a weird gait." So it's just dealing with injuries and then. Ultimately, those injuries create other injuries, and yep. and you're kind of in this spiral. We're getting like, old, man. You know, I, I am. I don't know about you guys. You guys are still in your 30s. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, I'm 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 right at right at 50. I'm getting there. I'm I'm like almost 50 years old, which is fucking nuts when I think about it. Yeah, because you'll be 50 and I'll be 40. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you're you're 47. Then? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I'm 37. I, yeah. yeah, it's always a decade. Are you 38? 37. 37. No, I'm a month older than him. That's why. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think we're at the point now where you're like, you you still, you still got it, but I think you start to get to the point where you're like, oh, if I don't maintain a certain protocol every day, like you can, you can, you can feel it slip. Oh, it goes fast for sure. I mean, especially when you compare yourself to being like in your 20s or something. I mean, fortunately, I think still not that hard, but yeah, if you, if I take a week off the gym, I, I like, I, physically see it and, and I feel it. Yeah. Yeah. I just like, I, I have to do something every day, like even just walking, mm-hmm. like I'll just bare minimum. You want to go for a sure. walk after this? You yeah, know, I would pick love some to. flowers. I you would know? love to. Fuck. I don't know. I would love to. Yeah. I'm going to hold hands. If no, I, I, I didn't suggest that. I said well, pick flowers if you want, whatever. But I yeah. Think, I think it's, a, I think that's a good, good topic because I, I was actually having this conversation with, um, Oh, my buddy Dave Rutherford. I fucking love this guy. And and uh, and then I was talking to Brett Phillips about it. I think the same topic, maybe the following day, which is the guy that started uh, Soft Lead. And we were talking about like just general inflammation and, and injuries and things like that. And there's this group out there, and you might, you know, listeners might be part of it, where they're kind of plagued with injuries a lot. And they want kind of an instant gratification fix to things where they're like, oh, I'm just going to take testosterone or, oh, I'm just going to do this or, oh, I'm just going to do that. Well, I'll tell you the first things you have to do, which is eliminate alcohol from consumption, number one, right? Number two, clean up your diet. Number three, exercise. So if you're like, stop drinking, you know, clean up your diet, meaning like, you know, low carb, high protein, like simple foods. When I say that, like non-processed foods. So you're just eating like basically. I mean, the meat, baseline of all that is fruit is inflammatory. Like your diet, yeah. mm-hmm. alcohol is obviously one of the worst inflammatories. Yeah. It, yeah. That's like, that's what fucking gives you injuries and hurts. Like, and you have zero recovery. I mean, well, and you can't sleep. So it's like, here's, you're taking away the cornerstone of recovery. If you're, you know, and we've all, 
we've all gone through this. So I'm not like speaking from a, a I actually a put mountain. tequila shots in my, <laughs> my protein shake post workout. It spikes my insulin for high absorption. I'm not sure if it's working. I think it must be. It's working, you know? I still got like a four pack. It's not a six one. It's it's, it's, like, it's bulk in season. It's like if you're if you're going through those th- those phases, like eliminate this, eliminate this, eliminate this. And then you're, you still need to supplement with what I would say is like testosterone and some of these other things that you're, you're, you might, because you might have low testosterone, but you got to kind of like work through those three phases before. And then you're, you're starting with relatively clean slate for performance because you've taken, or you've taken out what I would say is the toxic variables. And if you got sleep, which is one thing that I've, I've worked really, really hard, like, and you have to work at it. It's not something that you are just, okay, well, I'm just going to go to fucking sleep now, at least as a guy that, you know, has been running a business and had a family and all these other things. Like, dude, you got a lot going on. And I would imagine a lot of the listeners have a lot going on. And if you don't have like six and a half, seven hours of good sleep, and if you're not building your environment to capture that sleep, just like you would anything else from a performance issue, you're fucking yourself at the end of the day. That's fair. Like, like I have to have like blackout curtains and a fucking noise machine. Or if I don't, when I'm travel, like I got to wear one of those stupid masks because I, I know ambient light. I, it's the uh, worst. It's the worst. Yeah. But ambient light doesn't allow you get it doesn't allow you to get into REM as effectively. And like I've just had to learn this, and I had to work on those things because as the stress builds from. Or, and it's not even just stress. It's like you get up three or four times a night. You have a new new kid. You know, kids getting up, mom's feeding, or you know, if you get the rotation on the bottle, that interruption in your sleep. Compound that with maybe a previous high adrenaline lifestyle. <laughs> those interruptions in your sleep, then they create a sleep pattern, and then that pattern you have to recover from in order to recapture what I would say is full value of, of your sleep, which then allows you to plug into your next day. And I, I've, I've talked to people about this a lot where it's like every day basically is our Olympics, especially as a guy, you know, guys that run businesses. It's like, you got to get up and perform. If you're sleep deprived, you can't perform at a standard where if you're going to lose, you're going to lose in life, <laughs> which, yeah, I, I tend to err on the fact that I don't want to be a fucking loser. So that's my that's my sage advice. Fix three things and then start working with tertiary. It's true. I mean, you sleep, alcohol directly affect your hormones, you know. And so it's like if people are in that cyclic behavior that's not um, promoting like good hormone levels, you go get your testosterone checked, it'll be low, of course, like yeah. 100%. And you might not need to get on like a TRT just but it reads that well way and then a lot of these institutions now like just want to over prescribe because mm-hmm. that's how they make money so it's like do it the clean way if that if they're if people are hurting and mm-hmm. then then supplement if you have to yeah it's a medic- medical industrial complex right yeah. so it's like their job or the pharmaceutical industrial complex it's their job to develop drugs that people want and or need and the whole system's you know if you understand what the the carrot and the stick is from the entire system and you're like well if first I can eliminate these three variables and then if, if I need additional help or medication, then that's the, that's the next phase. But if you can't yeah. like pull in 5,000 calories, have all of those, you know, being processed foods and sugar, like then drown yourself in, you know, a half bottle of wine or, you know, a half bottle of alcohol in the evening, never work out and then expect it. Oh, why the fuck do I feel like this? Well, I, I got a pretty good idea as to why. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, doctors are funny these days too. Like I, uh, so I have like nerve damage in my head, so I get like uh, like really bad pain. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's there's no nothing that can take it away because it's it's nerve, um, whatever. But there they were like, we can try to get you on an SRI, which is an antidepressant, because a side effect of that will could help manage the pain of the nerve. And I was just like, what They're- the fuck? No, <clears throat> like it was just it was bizarre to be like. A, a patient to someone trying to prescribe that in, in as a fucking doctor to say, you're going to put me on antidepressant and SRI to help with nerve pain. It, it was just a very, very bizarre suggestion. And my response was an absolutely no fuck off. Um, but like those compounding things, if you get on something like that, it's just going to add a whole nother fucking level of issues in your life. Mm-hmm. So 
Well, and then trying to get off, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's yeah. like, how do you get off of something like that? Because it's essentially rewired yeah. your brain. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, your your serotonin levels are just askew for, for a very long time after that. I had the same thing happen to me. Really? As I was I was going through uh some inflammation stuff and like it it was causing stress with me because I didn't know what was going on. And that was one of the first things that she suggested is like, Well, I can get you on an SSRI. I'm like, What? Like we're we're in like the beginning stages. <laughs> I subbed like, my toe trying now. to figure out what's wrong and like that's Here's the first thing you throw out. It's, like it's it's wild. My IT band is a little bit flared up. And well, how about a little bit of Adderall for you? <laughs> yeah. What? How the fuck does this work out? Yeah. <laughs> how did we get here? I, Jesus. I do like I, I have noticed why I've got to cut off caffeine around like two. If I don't, like it affects my sleep. Yeah. And like in the mornings I'll have like two cups of coffee. If we've got a podcast, like one of the reasons why I'm not actually drinking coffee right now. It's actually noon, but um I'm trying to cut my caffeine take intake off a little bit earlier in the day so it doesn't affect my sleep in the evening. So I switch over to decaf, which I, I mean, I, I drink coffee all day long, so it doesn't matter. And our decaf, I forget how fucking good it is. And I forget because I don't drink a lot of our decaf, or at least I haven't for a long time. And when I went down the rabbit hole a few years ago with this, uh, I, I I developed this fucking incredible decaf coffee because my wife was pregnant. She couldn't have caffeine at the time. So I was like, hey, we have to have good coffee in the house. I didn't even think about decaf until... My wife got pregnant. So then I was like forced to build this decaf product that I was super fucking happy with. And I love it. It's it's What's, actually a fucking great coffee. Because I don't know this off the top of my head. Because you look at like say 80 milligrams of caffeine in a standard cup of coffee. Like decaf, what do you think? Like 5, 10? There's hardly any. It's, yeah. it's like sub 1% if any. Because it's oh, Swiss really? water processing, which is there's, – there's a couple different processing methods out there that are like the primary – processing methods but swiss water is what i would say is the best way because there are other other ways require a chemical and then the chemical essentially leaches back into the coffee which also is um highly carcinogenic so the swiss water essentially all you're doing is you're you're saturating the coffee with water and then you're extracting the caffeine because it's bonding with the 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 water molecule itself and so you're filtering it out in a very natural way you also keep the the flavor profile of coffee bean that way so you're pulling all the caffeine out and then you're rehydrating it so you're rehydrating the bean and through that process you're essentially eliminating the caffeine while maintaining the integrity of the bean and the flavor mm. so it's you're getting all the benefits of a of a great tasting coffee without the caffeine, uh, which by the way, that's kind of the only way I would suggest buying decaf at any point in time is you can only buy Swiss water processed decaf. Everything else is like inferior. Hmm. Fair. Yeah. I thought there was a little more caffeine in there. I didn't mm -mm. No, it's, it's, it's fairly. And I think that the process itself has like been around for almost like, I think like 70 years, you know, it was, this process method was literally developed by the Swiss. Um, and they, the, the reason for it was because of the chemical components of the other one. So just interesting side. Note. Just mm. reminds me of the SNL skit when, uh, Chris with Chris oh Farley, God. where they do the, the hidden camera and like, did yeah. you know you're drinking decaffeinated Columbia yeah. coffee? <laughs> yeah. <crystals? Yes. laughs> and pull that clip. And pull, can we put that clip bottom. in this episode? Cause yeah. it's so good. Yeah. Pull that clip. And add that episode to it, Heston. You're drinking Colombian decaf coffee crystals. What? You son of a bitch. You no good damn son of a bitch. Heston's the uh, producer here, by the way. So he's mm -hmm. the guy in the background. It's interesting because we have this cowboy running our podcast. And so when you look at him, you're like, this guy should be like roping and riding, but really he's roping and riding those fucking mics and so, computers over so there. So <laughs> Heston, Heston texted me. So um, I got back from um, Power Slap and then um, went to the PBR. 
um, the you rodeo, did? rodeos in town. Fuck yeah, dude. Okay, okay. Got to got to meet with some of the folks over there too. With the awesome, awesome, awesome fucking sport. But Heston texts me because they walked us out into the center of um, the pen, so you like actually get in the arena in the center, so the bulls are like riding right in front of you. And he saw me, and he was like. Love, fuck, or fuck, pretty much like because yeah. he was in the nosebleeds but that shit was fun dude those cowboys are riding the dirt's getting thrown on you in there it was a yeah that was it was a cool it's experience intense. a lot of those guys are like five five 135 pounds like 18 19 i they're didn't like know jockeys they're yeah. exactly like jockeys and then like the the portuguese like brazilians mm-hmm. they're like half running that sport it's crazy i don't know why it's Seriously? so big I yeah, yeah. like half the the athletes huh. there were were from brazil Wow. What are what are the guys called that um, are responsible for wrangling the bulls and broncos? What is it, Hessen? The bullfighters, yeah. The, they're yeah, sponsored by they the call? Air Force too, which is kind of funny. Rodeo clowns, yeah. I always thought those guys they never get enough credit. Like the balls it takes to to be out there. And, well, like, the other thing is you're wearing a fucking clown outfit. Yeah. <laughs> you're like you're in a, yeah. you got clown all these makeup. like cowboys riding bulls, and you're yeah. like in a clown outfit, like. The dichotomy yeah. of this, whatever we got going on here, is a little bit crazy. If you step back, like we got clowns in the center of this dirt stadium with fucking wild animals, essentially, and then men riding on the back of them. With, this is fucking insane. With rubber yeah. bands on their testicles, yeah. right? Do they still do that? Is that? Oh, okay. Dude, okay. some of those bulls are just like, holy shit, because we walked up into the pens. They're They're like... Dude, they're on gear or something, man. They, like, they're. I think they're all running gear. I don't. I don't know. I know what, nothing what just, about the sport, but I want to learn. What, what kind of testosterone does a does a bull run? like? Give me that <laughs> stuff. That I like want the, elephant I want testosterone. The, Is that like rhinoceros testosterone? It came from like, Russia. I know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like Putin's side hustle. It's yeah. Like yeah. Bull steroids. Yeah, it's, it's a rowdy sport. It was. It was super fun. It's the first time I've ever been to a PBR. Yeah, those guys are legit, man. One dude snapped his arm in half and just like walked it off. Just casually walked off if he broke his arm in half um yeah those, those those kids are tough if you had to choose you got to do a power slap or you got to give eight seconds eight seconds yeah because like you're just getting slapped in the face i've had that happen to me before you know yeah it's, some crazy women it's my pretty day, much a guarantee no um oh yeah didn't yeah. you didn't you break your arm or something along a horse. Time? A horse yeah, yeah. The good old Jared Taylor who flew a drone over the horse twice. Um, and the horse was like, you're going to get the fuck off me. I was like, okay. <laughs> you got off. I, th- I was overconfident in my athleticism because it was bucking me. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And I didn't know how to ride a horse for some of it on the horse. And I tried to like time to jump off it after about six, seven seconds because that thing was not letting me stay on it. I'm like, I'll just jump off and like barrel roll. I Yeah, the complete opposite happened. You just shattered my knee, broke my arm, put my <laughs> teeth in my fuck? face. Jeez. Yeah. That was a good one. <laughs> I, I know because you had and I no cast. longer work for the agency after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you had that cast. Yeah, like we when we did hipster waterboarding back in the day. Yeah, you remember you're wearing that cast and the video. Yeah, put camo like, on it too. Yeah, play stupid games, win, win stupid, stupid prizes. prizes. Mm. Yeah, that's like an epic. Was it like epic video? Ten years ago now. I ten think? years ago. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. That was the first. A lot of life's happened. One. Yeah, first viral video. Um. Well, shit. Yeah, fellas. It's good. Hunter Seven, check out. Yeah, Hunter Seven and the presents we just dropped. Yeah, and UFC two ninety eight, which will be um this Saturday. Uh, check out Black Rifle Coffee on the mat. We're excited. I'll be in yeah. Anaheim watching it right there in the arena. So, fucking amped. And uh, I guess try our decaf because it's damn, yeah, it's damn good. Hmm. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys.